Hey everyone, Nicky Skevich back with Daily Fantasy Winners for this next edition of Tita Green. And it is for the Sony Open this week. It is the second of two tournaments in Hawaii back to back here. And even though this tournament is in Hawaii, just like last week, it is pretty much the exact opposite in pretty much nearly every single way in comparison to the Tournament of Champions. It's uh, obviously a tournament that has a full field. We've got 140 players here this week instead of 34, like if there was a Kapalua. And if you take a look, and so that means obviously there's going to be a cut here after the first two rounds. And if you take a look at the differences in the golf courses, YLA Country Club this week in comparison to Kapalua Plantation last week, this course is much shorter, much narrower, much flatter, much smaller greens. This is a par 70 and not par 73. So pretty much in every single way, it's it's pretty much the exact uh, the exact opposite, despite that they're both in Hawaii. So, uh, but that's not anything new. That's it's like this every every single year. We've got a, the same type of a strength of field this week. It's uh, it's on the weaker side, despite a couple of the top names being in it, like Jordan Spieth and Justin Thomas and those guys. But for the most part, it's a weaker field, top to bottom. And so, uh, in any case, yeah, uh, there's really nothing new as far as the Sony Open this year in comparison to past years, same course, same kind of weather conditions, all that kind of stuff. And so uh, nothing really to say there uh, without getting into the top picks. But the one thing I do want to bring up here as it relates to DraftKings and FanDuel in terms of their salary structure, I just wanted to touch on this because this is the first full field of 2018. <clears throat> and that is, if we take a look here, uh, you've probably noticed, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry about that. Uh, on DraftKings, we've got uh, the, the min salary on DraftKings is 6600 That is much higher than it's usually been. Um, we've usually, well, I should say last year, the min salary was usually around 6400 I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, maybe 6300 And so that was also an increase off of what it used to be a couple years ago. The way DraftKings used to do it a couple of years ago, I'm sure as most of you were watching this might remember or know, but maybe you're new to DFS golf, and that is the min salary used to be like in the upper 5,000 range, which I thought was much better. And the reason for that is because you just open the door for more for more strategy or more making different types of lineups. And that works for cash and GPP. And what we also had a couple of years ago is the odds per dollar, just top to bottom, was much more in line, uh, much more accurate. And what I mean by that is the, the salaries of each golfer were more in line with what the sportsbook odds were. Um, and now sportsbook odds isn't necessarily a, an exact win predictor, but for the most part, it's what the market says. And, the, you know, and they're going to be moving the, 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 uh, the odds based on where the money's at, obviously. And so there is uh, obviously a, a heavy correlation there, of course. And so in any case, uh, that's where it used to be. But now what we're seeing here is over the last couple of years, over the last couple of years, and what I mean by that is this year and last year, 2017, is that the odds per dollar has been much more inaccurate, or the DraftKings, for whatever reason, doesn't care about being as accurate in comparison to the sportsbook odds. And their min salary has increased to 6,600. So what that's going to do here for the, from a GPP perspective, especially, is that that means a lot of these mid-tier price guys in the 7K range uh, who have really good odds per dollar, and we'll just pull up an example here this week if we scroll up here, excuse me, to the 7K range. Uh, let's take a look here. Uh, Gary Woodland's a great example here at 3.46. Uh, Gary Woodland's probably going to have some pretty high ownership because if you take a look at Gary Woodland, there's nobody really around his odds per dollar uh, and around his price point. Everybody's at least, uh, you know, the most, that looks like the best there is is like a 2.240 with Bill Hawes, uh, 2.55 actually with Peter Uline. So they're, you know, the, Pretty much Gary Woodland, you already know, is going to have some pretty good ownership there. And if we scroll down here, uh, Jason Duffner is a 3.06 here on DraftKings. And so uh, we're, we're going to see, obviously, some pretty high ownership with those couple guys. And, and we're going to see this probably every single week because uh, of the way this salary structure works and that the men's salary is much higher because nobody really needs to go for these bad golfers. So essentially what it's going to do is that because the worst golfers now are not as cheap, that they're where they were already kind of near unplayable, but maybe a few of them might be an option. Now they're all, for all intents and purposes, unplayable just by going by the price. And so I, I don't like that. It's just taking away options out of the field of what DraftKings is doing. And so, and if you take a look at FanDuel, who's obviously changed their structure overall, because remember FanDuel, they've changed their format a couple times since introducing golf. 
Uh, they went from the Thursday Friday format uh, for rounds one and two, and then Saturday Sunday formats for rounds three and four. And you do four for rounds one, two, and then another four for rounds three, four. They switched it to going to just eight golfers all four rounds, and now they've changed it again. And where they're saying it's going to be six golfers, just like DraftKings, except we're going to give you sixty thousand dollars in uh, instead of fifty, like DraftKings does. And their, but their men's salary is $7,000. And if I filter by here, let's filter by FanDuel salary. We scroll all the way down here, you'll see the men's salary is $7,000. There's a three guys here but that, don't, that are on DraftKings and not FanDuel for whatever reason. But in any case, uh, this is uh, the men's salary is 7K on FanDuel. And so, but the thing is, because you have $60,000 to play with instead of 50,000, the average price per player uh, starting from scratch on FanDuel is $10,000 in comparison to $8,333 like DraftKings. So even though FanDuel's men's salary is slightly higher, the average price per golfer is much higher. And so there are, the, it, basically where this comes down to is that the ownership for these middle price players uh, will not be as inflated or it won't be as bad on FanDuel just because of the way that works out. And then you also just take a look at the odds per dollar column here on the second to right hand side here, FanDuel odds per dollar. If you follow along here, the odds per dollar, if you just kind of glance at it, and you got, this is available to the website. Remember, this is completely free, of course, uh, on the website just by signing up. It is, if you do take a look, just kind of glancing down here, the odds per dollar on FanDuel is more accurate than DraftKings this week, it does seem like. And if I have to guess just because of the way the formats are set up, I'm guessing that's going to be a theme here this year, that FanDuel will be a little bit more in line with the sports book than DraftKings, and so the ownerships won't be quite as bad on those middle price players, and it'll open the door for uh, some more options, which I think is better. So that's just... Uh, for my two cents, and I just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention. And so, before we get into uh, these picks, and just to keep that in mind when you are making your lineups, and if you have more questions about that, please, of course, remember you can always hit me up on the forum at dailyfantasywinners.com or of course, uh, on Twitter as well. You can hit me up there as well. And so, uh, okay, anyways, let's get on with this. Uh, talk about this tournament with the Sony Open. And so uh, the, we're going to talk about the top five golfers here in price point, and we'll do it by DraftKings here. Uh, so that is Jordan Spieth, Justin Thomas, Mark Leishman, Brian Harmon, and Kevin Kisner. Let's start with Jordan Spieth. So we have, uh, from a uh, course history perspective or tournament history, Jordan Spieth has played here twice. He missed the cut in 2014. He finished third last year. Uh, finished third. I know Justin Thomas won it last year, obviously, because Justin shot that 59 out of the gate and uh, was pretty much in control of that tournament. And so not too much to go off of the course history, though, obviously. I mean, two times, not really going to tell you much. Jordan Spieth's one of the best players, obviously, why he finished third in 2017. And uh, I guess just off to a bad start there in 2014 for whatever reason. And so uh, if we take a look at Spieth last week, he finished ninth at the at the Century Tournament of Champions. Uh, he finished tied for 18th in driving accuracy. Jordan's not the best driver of the golf ball when it comes to accuracy, but uh, still T18, that's kind of that's still kind of bad for him, especially at a course like Kapalua and given who was kind of in the field, I guess, that week. If we take a look at the strokes game putting, which was the main reason why Jordan Spieth did not play well, it, it was a minus or a minus 0.942 strokes gained putting uh, against the field last week. That is really bad. And the one thing to keep in mind, though, just in fairness of that, is when you do take a look at the strokes gained statistics on a, on a tournament basis, if you're going to have fewer golfers in the field like last week was where you basically had, you know, a quarter to a, a fifth of what the normal size of the field would be, the strokes gain statistics are going to be inflated because you're obviously these statistics are done in comparison versus the field of that week. And so if you have fewer people to compare it against, the range of how many strokes you're gaining or losing to the field is going to be magnified there a little bit uh, and everything. And so uh, so for Jordan Spieth, or there, there's, or there's more variability to it. I should more uh, clear that up. But uh, so, anyways, uh, Spieth had a bad day or a bad week putting. Uh, round one was especially where that came up, where he shot uh, two over in the first round. I believe that's where his driving accuracy was pretty bad, and his, his putting was just horrible. I believe he said after the first round that he just kind of struggled getting used to the speed of the greens, meaning that they were kind of slow. Yet, uh, with the way the wind was blowing and how hard it was blowing, it was just a little bit of a tough thing for him to uh, adjust to. And so, that, and I mean, that happens. It, it can happen to anybody. And so, uh, but we do know Jordan Speed is one of the best putters on tour, obviously. And that also, the one thing to keep in mind for the Sony Open is that 
there aren't many courses that usually pop for strokes gain putting as being a big correlation indicator, but the Sony Open actually is a course that usually promotes strokes gain putting. Uh, the, the meaning, when I say strokes gain putting, it just means this, who's usually good at it every single year, who's going to be who's more recognized as the best putters on tour when you take a look at the strokes gain statistics over the past few years. And so and Spieth's definitely one of them. Therefore, I do think, even though that Spieth had a bad putting week last week, his driving accuracy was eh, and driving accuracy does help a little bit here. I still think Spieth being the odds on favorite here this week, I believe he's about four and a half to five to one somewhere in that department. Uh, th that's definitely warranted uh, as far as just being the favorite. I, don't, I wouldn't bet that if I were you. I think it should be more like six or seven to one probably. I don't think it's a good uh, a, a good odds for you to bet on it. But I do think he is should be the odds on favorite here this week. And one thing to keep in mind also, you know, we also know one of the biggest strikes of Jordan Spieth's game is the is the strokes gained uh, approaching the green. The iron play and the wedge play is fantastic. He was tied for first in greens in regulation last week at hitting 82% of his greens. So that's obviously really good, especially when you consider how uh, that his driver was a little bit off last week. And so uh, in any case, uh, just because of that, and you take a look at the odds per dollar here, obviously, and where people are priced, Jordan Spieth clearly giving you great odds right there. So if you're going to go on the expensive side of things, Jordan Spieth, not a bad option at all. I do think he is a better choice than Justin Thomas, despite that Justin is the defending champion. Um, if we take a look at Justin Thomas here over the last three years, uh, which is the only three times he's played in the Sony Open, he missed the cut in 2016, uh, but he did finish tied for sixth in 2015. And like I said, he won last year uh, in 2017 and shot that 59 out of the gate. And so if we take a look at Justin for last week's st statistics in, at the Century Tournament of Champions, he finished tied for 22nd overall, which obviously wasn't very good, and he did not really play any, he didn't really have a great round until Sunday where he believe, believe he shot 67, everything else was in the 70s. His driving accuracy was pretty bad, he finished tied for 26th, he was average, tied for 13th in greens and regulation, but the strokes game putting was really bad for Justin Thomas as well. So minus .896, uh, that's pretty bad obviously, even when you consider that's uh, inflated a little bit. And so with that being, so with factoring all this in, uh, is Justin, can Justin Thomas win this tournament? Absolutely. But I would much rather have Spieth than Thomas, given that this course probably fits Jordan Spieth a little bit better. And uh, Spieth's form is probably a little bit better. I know he didn't putt well last week, but I still think Spieth's form a tiny bit is a little bit better. Uh, when you compare the Hero World Challenge at, in December, and then you also take a look at, of course, the Century Tournament Champions. It isn't much. I know that's not much to go off of, of course, history when we're talking about, you know, <laughs> some pretty easy golf courses with wide fairways and obviously limited field. So it's not like a, a, a big thing, but I, that is one little tiny factor that I like for speed, and it's just a better course fit. And I think Spieth's usually uh, got a higher uh, floor than, uh, than Justin Thomas does, and so... Uh, kind of like what we saw last week, uh, just because I think Spieth's a little more consistent there. So, uh, In any case, moving on to Mark Leishman. If you are looking to pivot for somebody here in these kind of these top five guys, if, you, if you're doing GPPs and you're looking for a second guy to pivot to here, I think Leishman's your guy. And the reason why I like Leishman is just because you kind of know what you're getting from him and there's no hole in his game. If you take a look at Leishman here, he's actually played in the Sony eight times. He's never missed the cut. His average finish is 19.8. Um, and then uh, he's never finished worse than T37. And his best finishes are 5th and ninth. And those came back in, uh, looks like, 2014 and 2013. And so that's actually pretty good here for, for Mark Leishman. And you factor in that he's obviously playing his best golf right now, really over the last year. Uh, you know, if, he's got the, if he's got that high of a floor and he's playing his best golf now with a pretty high ceiling, I think that's a pretty good indicator. And like I said, this is a golf course that really, uh, you know, it, it promotes stroke scheme putting. It promotes, you know, a little bit on the driving accuracy standpoint. And Leishman doesn't really have a hole in his game. He can pretty much compete at any type of a golf course. So good signs there. Uh, if we do take a look at Leishman last week at the Century, he played three fantastic rounds. Saturday was just abysmal for him for whatever reason. Um, if he had just even put, put up something around like one under on Saturday, he maybe could have given, I don't, I still think Dustin Johnson would have won, but I think Mark Leishman maybe, maybe could have given him a run. We, you know, we won't, we won't know, obviously, but I thought Leishman obviously still played pretty well other than that one bad round. He ended up finishing tied for seventh. His driving accuracy was a little bit off, but uh, his iron play was fantastic. Did gain .424 strokes putting. 
in the field last week and so he put putted pretty solidly but he is a pretty good putter and that's not like super inflated like it's not like he gained like over a stroke on the field or something like that and so that's a uh, that's like one thing to just keep in mind there and so anyways bottom line i think leishman's kind of your nice pivot option there as far as the most expensive guys and we'll move on to brian Harmon. uh brian Harmon and kevin kisner are going to be kind of in the same boat here uh probably not going to recommend picking either of them as far as cash games go that's for sure uh, as far as gpps of course it depends on how many lineups you're making but uh just to kind of dive into why for brian Harmon, he's played here six times made the cut five of six times uh tied for 13th in 2015 and 2016 are his best finishes last week he finished third in the century which was pretty good uh his driving accuracy and iron play was solid and he gained 4.88 strokes putting which is obviously a pretty solid as well but the one thing i really don't like when it comes to Harmon is that if we do take a look at the our updated uh, strokes gained putting regression tool which now is including all the data uh you know we're, we're doing it off of 2018 data now so there isn't a ton of 2018 tur- not a ton of 20 to 2018 tournaments to go off of here to compare to previous years but uh it is something just worth noting if we do take a look at brian Harmon, he is gaining 1.321 strokes putting on the year so far so you take a look at brian Harmon's recent performance or recent history kind of this year and you like what you see but he is really outdoing himself on the greens right now and it's just not sustainable and this is a pretty expensive price to pay for brian Harmon when you just take a look at who uh, brian Harmon is priced above when you talk about kevin kisner zach johnson webb simpson russell henley cameron smith and they're these guys are all like a thousand dollars a thousand dollars cheaper uh tony finau especially like right there at 8900 uh, i mean most of these guys are probably actually around the skill level of brian Harmon and what around what he should do um, if you factor in a little bit of the regression so i just don't think it's a great price for brian Harmon. uh yes strokes game putting is a correlating thing here and brian Harmon is a good putter i mean if you do take a look at brian Harmon in the strokes game putting department you'll see he's been above uh, clearly way uh well above average here the last couple of years uh slightly above average in 2014 and 2015 but this isn't going to continue this isn't usually a sustainable thing he might still be you know around a 0.4 0.5 you know if he has another really good year putting but still most likely uh what we would expect for our model is it's gonna he's he's gonna gain some shots in the field but it'll only be about 0.24 that's kind of what we're expecting uh, maybe it'll be slightly better we'll see and so uh but again 1.321 that's not sustainable so anyways i've said enough there uh so Harmon's not my favorite pick there uh for kevin kisner he's played here six times he's actually only made the cut here three of six times but the re well not the reason for it but the one of the biggest things you see here with this is that uh he missed the cut often in early in his career and kevin kisner really esk was a slightly we'll call him a slightly late bloomer uh when it comes to golf and peaking and everything like that because kisner nobody really knew who he was until he went into that playoff with ricky fowler at the players a few years ago and so really since that point kisner's been playing some fantastic golf you know to, to some extent at least and so you take a look at kisner he's actually finished tied for fifth and tied for sixth in the sony open the last couple of years so he's been playing much better here as of late and it makes sense based on where he's played at all other tournaments and kind of the timing of his career uh last week if you take a look at the century uh driving accurate driving accuracy was uh was pretty good tied for sixth uh his greens and regulation was awful t for 20 t26 which is pretty bad considering how good his driving accuracy was and how big these greens are he gained 1.576 strokes putting and he finished tied for 17th <laughs> so the one thing here if there's something to take away here with kisner last week was that he putted his brains out just to finish tied for 17th which is not exactly a great indicator and so uh i don't want to look too heavily into a one week thing type of thing because kisner usually is a pretty good putter but that obviously uh, is not a good sign when you're putting your brains out just to finish middle of the pack in a limited field that's that's obviously not a good sign and if we do take a look at kevin kisner here in the strokes game putting regression tool uh he is gaining 0.94 strokes uh on the field right here so far this year in the couple few tournaments he has played that is obviously a little bit uh that's certainly not sustainable to a certain extent and so uh, again like like brian Harmon, kevin kisner is a good putter but he's not as good as a 0.940 so that's uh that's not exactly a great thing and so just from a form standpoint of what we saw last week a little bit of putting regression here 
And just overall from a price standpoint and looking at everybody else, I'd probably rather just grab Leishman or grab Spieth and then take some of these other guys in the middle and in the in the middle tier, whether it's the 9K, 8K, 7K on, on both sites, DraftKings and FanDuel. I think that's a little bit of up the better route to go. And so uh, that is it for this video. Just remember uh, the putting regression tool, the odds per dollar, uh, and the uh, T to green regression tool, these are all free uh, on the website here, as you can see. Uh, if you click on them and you just sign up, it's completely free. And we are in the final stages of installing the PGA tournament history where you can take a look at uh, you compare all the tournaments over the last handful of years. Um, it's going to take an average of all the handful of years, actually, I should say, at a specific tournament. And I'll just tell you which tournaments give up the most eagles per player, or e eagles per golf round, most birdies per golf round, most pars, most bogeys, most double bogeys. Um, it'll show you what by scoring average by the total score, scoring average by uh, by under par. And I believe it's going to show something else. Let me just pull this up. And it'll show you just what the average winning score is here uh, for over the last, like, several years and everything like that. And so, uh, in any case, uh, that, that's going up very soon. That'll be available. Hopefully, it'll actually be available by the time you're watching this video. It might be. And so, uh, hopefully, that's the case. Okay, anyways, that's it. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, if you've got any questions about any of this type of stuff, uh, I'm at Nikki Skevich on Twitter. Uh, also, have, you also very well can hit me up at the forum on the Daily Fantasy Winners website. That's the, probably the better way to do it, actually, when it comes to the golf related questions so we're not limited to you know well 280 characters uh, even though that sometimes may not be enough and so uh hit me up on the forum that's probably the best way to do it and i will also share some thoughts on the middle price and the cheaper golfers as well as far as some people i like and maybe don't like as far as this week goes so anyways thanks for watching and good luck